Hello and welcome to our lesson on limits. So when we're finding what we call the limit of a function, all we're doing is analyzing a particular behavior of that function. And this is something we've done before, so I want to connect this to some prior learning. Uh, so when you're analyzing the behavior of a function, we are considering both variables. Uh, both inputs and outputs have to be considered, but we use them differently. So it's the independent variables, the inputs, generally x values, but we can use whatever variable we want. So those independent inputs, those are just used as a frame of reference. So the inputs are kind of telling us where to look, or where are we analyzing a particular behavior. The behavior that we're actually analyzing, uh, behaviors like where are we increasing, decreasing, positive, negative, those types of behaviors, those behaviors are actually based on what the outputs are doing. So are the outputs increasing? Are the outputs decreasing? Are the outputs constant? Are the outputs positive? And so on. So the independent, those in, inputs, um, again, those are our frame of reference. Those are the where to look. The behavior that we're actually going to analyze is completely based on the dependent variable, which again, those are going to be our outputs. And I'm trying to keep this generic, but generally these are going to be x's and these are going to be y's. Okay? So again, to connect this to some prior learning, let's let's look at a few examples of things we've done before. Like in this first graph. If I wanted to analyze, let's say, where the graph was increasing versus where it was decreasing, I think we know how to do this. If we were reading it from left to right, we would say, okay. This portion of the graph is decreasing. It is going down from left to right till it gets to that turning point, that vertex. And then this portion of the graph is increasing. It is going up from left to right. Now that's the very basic way to describe that behavior. But technically we would say over the interval from negative infinity to negative three, this domain corresponds with this section of the graph. So we would say over the domain from negative infinity to negative three, so this set of x values from negative infinity to negative three, that is where our graph is decreasing, which means that is where our y values are decreasing. So I would say this graph is decreasing over the interval from negative infinity to negative three. So this is our frame of reference. This is where we're looking. And we're saying it's decreasing because over that interval, the y values are decreasing. Okay, and then similarly here, this interval of x values that picks up at negative three and goes toward positive infinity, that's the interval of x values that corresponds with this section of the graph. So I would say that this graph is increasing over the interval from why am I saying negative three? That's definitely a positive three. Uh, positive three to infinity. And again, that's the frame of reference. That's okay, if we're looking over this interval, when we say it's increasing, it's because over that interval, over that domain, the y values are increasing, okay? And then let's look at another behavior in the next example. So increasing versus decreasing, the graph is going up versus the graph is going down. Um, if I wanted to analyze, let's say, where a graph was positive versus negative. Again, that would be where are the y values positive versus where are the y values negative. So in this particular graph, uh, it touches the x-axis here. So at that y value of zero, right, a y value of zero at this point, the graph isn't positive or negative, that output of zero doesn't have a sign attached. But for all of these y or all of these points above that x-intercept, we have positive y values, which means that section of the graph is positive, and that corresponds with this set of x values. So here's the negative three I was trying to use in the other example. From negative three to positive infinity, we have a section of graph that is positive. So over that domain, over that set of x values, that's the frame of reference. If we're looking over the interval from negative three to infinity, we would say this graph is positive because in that interval, the y values are positive. So we would say, okay, this is positive from negative three to infinity. And then uh, similarly, change my highlighter here, this section of graph right here that is below that x-intercept, below the x-axis, all the, the y values and all of those coordinates are negative, so we would say that portion of the graph is negative, and that corresponds with this domain. So we would say over this interval from negative infinity to negative three, the graph is negative. So this is our frame of reference, 
uh, the interval from negative infinity to negative 3, and we would say it's negative there because the y values are negative there. Okay? And then another behavior I'm sure we've analyzed before, um, end behaviors. So if we're looking for the end behaviors, we have this notation. For instance, I might say as x goes to or approaches infinity, uh, the y values go to what, right? And then as x goes to negative infinity, the y values go to some end behavior, okay? So maybe this notation looks familiar. I'm really hoping that notation looks familiar. Um, but again, it's frame of reference. So if we are on the x-axis going toward positive infinity, on the x-axis going toward positive infinity means we're going to the right. So this is our frame of reference. This is saying go to the right end of the graph and tell me where the y values are headed. Well, this graph appears to have an asymptote in it. It appears, actually go to this color. There is an asymptote in this graph, a horizontal asymptote here at uh, negative three. And so it looks like the y values are approaching negative three. As we follow that graph on that right end, as those x values get closer and closer to positive infinity, those y values get closer and closer and closer to that horizontal asymptote. So we're gonna say the end behavior here is as x goes to infinity, y goes to negative three. And then this end, as x goes to negative infinity, if we're on the x-axis going toward negative infinity, we're going left. So this notation, again, frame of reference says go to the left end of the graph and tell me where the y values are headed. So if I go to the left end, well, that left end is going up forever. And if we went up forever, we would see those y values getting larger and larger and larger and growing toward positive infinity. So the other end behavior, we would say as x goes to negative infinity, y goes to positive infinity, where again, we have the frame of reference. We're told where the x's are going, and then we're trying to figure out where the y's are headed based on that frame of reference. Okay, so these are all behaviors that we've analyzed before. But again, I just wanted to clarify the x values are a frame of reference. It's the y values that are the behavior we're trying to look at, okay? So this is a very similar concept to what we're doing when we're finding limits. When we're finding a limit, we're just um, analyzing another behavior of a function. So a limit is another tool that we use to describe the behavior of a function at a, a particular um, at a particular number, so as our x values are approaching a particular number to be specific. So let me give you some notation. It's going to sound a little formal, and then we get into some of the examples. Hopefully it'll feel sort of like what we were doing a second ago. So if a function, let's just call our function f of x, if it becomes arbitrarily close, like infinitely closer, closer and closer to a single number, and we're just going to call that number l, as x approaches a certain number, we'll call that number c from either side, then we're going to say that the limit of f of x as x approaches c is l. And again, that might not mean a whole lot to you. If you've never seen this before, that probably sounds kind of crazy, but this is the notation that says what I just tried to say. Okay, if we're reading this, we're going to say the limit as x approaches c of f of x is L, okay? Or sometimes um, we can say also the limit of f of x as x approaches c is L. So a couple of different ways to read that. I think the second way I said it is the preferred way. So again, the limit of f of x as x approaches c is L is how we're going to read that. Now, what does this mean? Again, it's a behavior. When we're saying that the limit of f of x as x approaches c is L, that means we have a frame of reference. We're looking at x values that are going to get closer and closer to c, which is just representing some real number. And as the x's get closer and closer to that number, our function gets closer and closer to some y value, and if that happens, that y value represents what we call the limit 
of that function. Okay, so we're analyzing a behavior. We're wanting to know what is our what y value is our function getting closer and closer to with this as our frame of reference, this x approaching c. So this is telling us where to look, where to look. Right, this is our frame of reference. Oh, my pen is really wide there. So this, again, um, this is an x value. That's our frame of reference. That's the where to look, however you want to identify that for yourself. Okay, so we're looking at the x values getting closer and closer to c, which is just like it could be x getting closer to 1 or x getting closer to negative 5 or whatever. c will be some number. And as the x's get closer to that number, does our function get closer and closer to a single number l? If it does, then l represents the limit of that function. So this is the y value the function approaches. Now there won't always be a particular y value that the function approaches um, as we get closer and closer to some x value, so there won't be a limit for every function, but if one exists, we should be able to find it. The y value the function approaches. Okay, so a couple little more details here and then we'll actually try to find some limits. Um, when we are finding limits of a function, there are really three ways to do this. So we can analyze the graph of a function like we did in those first three examples. We can actually actually follow a graph at a as we get closer and closer to some x value is there a y value that our function approaches. Um, we can also do this making a table of values. So like a t-chart when you're going to make a graph. So we can pick our inputs that get arbitrarily closer to some value that we're looking at and then analyze the behavior of the y values. Or we can take an algebraic approach, which is kind of what I prefer if I can use it um, so that I don't have to rely on a calculator. And you'll see why the algebraic approach um, is, a, is a possibility where we're just evaluating our function at C. That will make sense after I think we do the first couple of graphs. Now, the limit um, that we're looking for, we have to be approaching from both sides. So this x value that we're looking at is given to us and we want to approach it from the left and approach it from the right. And so we're actually looking at two things. We call them one-sided limits. A one-sided limit approaches an x value from just one side. So we're going to approach from the left, we're going to approach from the right, and as we approach from both the left and the right, if we are converging to the same place, that place is our limit. That y value that we approach is our limit. So the one-sided limits we're going to find first to see if our limit uh, exists. So a one-sided limit, again, is approaching from one side. If I want to say approach the x value from the left, we'll put this little minus above the number we're approaching. And that's to say approach from the left. And if I want to approach from the right, I will put the plus sign with the C there. So that plus and minus has nothing to do with the sign of our number that is telling us which side to approach from. So that plus sign there means to approach from the right. Approach from the right, approach from the left. And if that doesn't make sense just yet, don't worry. When we get to some of the examples, it will. Now, if we're approaching from the left and from the right, according to our definition of a limit, if we approach the same y value from the left and from the right, that y value is going to be our limit. If we approach different y values from the right and from the left, then the limit does not exist. So when the one-sided limits at a particular value of x are different, the limit does not exist and we can just say d n e in the future so that we don't have to write that out. Okay, so three ways we can, or common ways we can find limits. Again, graphically, using a table of values, or algebraically. I just realized I didn't complete that word. There you go, algebraically. Um, and we're going to look at examples in each of those formats. So first, let's look at some graphs, okay? How do we find the limit using a graph? So for this first example, it says find the limit of x squared plus 1 as x approaches 1. So this is our frame of reference saying let's look at our graph 
approach that x value of 1 from the left and approach that x value of 1 from the right, what y value are we getting closer and closer to as we do that? So on my function, if I go up to my, I didn't actually want my highlighter there, if I get to my function here at that x value, right? if I approach that function from the left and I approach, sorry, if I'm on that function approaching that x value from the left and I am approaching that x value from the right, this is really, highlighter is like too wide. Let me just do this. As I approach that x value from the left and I approach that x value from the right, I can see that we're on in both sides there as I approach that x value of 1, I'm approaching the same point. And that point has a y value of 2, right? So this x value of 1 corresponds with a y value of 2 on the graph. And whether I approach that point from the left or approach that point from the right, we are approaching the same point, which means we are approaching the same y value as we get closer and closer to that x value. And that y value is the limit for this function, okay, at that particular x value. So I would say the limit of x squared plus 1 as x approaches 1 is 2. So this is where to look. This is the y value the function approaches as we look there. Okay, Not a tough concept, I, I hope. <laughs> really just looking for a point on a graph. It seems kind of simple, but it, it's not always that straightforward, so bear with me. Okay, so next we're going to find the limit as x approaches 3 of this function, x squared minus 9 over x minus 3. So the graph is here, again, so that we can use this graphical uh, approach. So an x value of 3, that's what we're trying to get closer and closer to. So that's the x value. Now I'm going to go up here to my function. Okay, this is the point, really, that we're looking at here. Now our function isn't actually defined in our x value of 3. That's why there's a hole in the graph, and it should make sense that we're not defined at x equals 3, because if I put 3 into this function, I get a 0 on the bottom of the fraction, which is no good. So we're not defined there, but that's okay. What we're trying to see here is, what is the y value that our function gets closer and closer to as we approach that point from the left and from the right? So if I'm approaching from the left or approaching from the right, that x value, right, if we're approaching that x value from the left and from the right, what's the y value that we get closer and closer to? Well, again, it's the same from both directions. This y value of 6 and x value of 3, right, this point at 3, 6, is the same point we are approaching from both directions. So as we're looking at that, or getting closer to that x value of 3, our function is approaching that y value of 6, which means the limit of x squared minus 9 divided by x minus 3 as x approaches 3 is 6. Again, we have a frame of reference where to look. What is the y value that we are approaching there? Um, it's 6. Okay. Now here we have a case where our limit's not going to exist. So the limit of the absolute value of x minus 2 over x minus 2 as x approaches 2. So from both directions, again, let me go to my frame of reference here, right? x equals 2. This is the x value we're looking at. If I go to my function here, and I go to my function here, so two different places. This function is not defined at x equals 2. Again, 2 cannot go into this function because it would be a 0 in the bottom of the fraction, which is not good, um, not defined for us. So the function is not defined at 2. But if I look at approaching from each side, Okay, when I approach from this side, my graph is going to, from the right, my graph is getting closer to the point here that has an x value of positive 1. So this point here at 2, 1, that's different from what's happening here. As I approach my x value of 2 from the left, I get closer to this point. And this point has a different y value, right? This point has a y value of negative 2. So a point here at 2, no, not negative 2, negative 1. I can read a graph, I promise. So at positive 2, we're down here at negative 1. Um, this is a case where our limit doesn't exist, because as I approach from the left and right, we're approaching different y values. So here, I would say that the limit of, I'm just going to call this function f of x, so I don't have to write this again. The limit of our function, I'm calling it f of x, as x approaches 
2 from the right is going to be positive 1, right? That's the positive 1 that we see here. And over here, the limit of f of x as x approaches 2 from the left is a different place. From the left, we're approaching a y value of negative 1. So on the others, I didn't separate the, the two sided, the each of the one-sided limits because we approached the same place, but because this is different here, these one-sided limits being different means that the limit as x approaches 2 from either side, we cannot define it. So this, we would say, does not exist, right? The limits um, on each side have to be the same in order for the limit to exist. Okay, so that's sort of a graphic approach uh, to finding a limit. But, and you can see from here, right, what we're trying to find is basically the point on the graph that our, um, our function is, is approaching, right? So if I know the x value is 1 and I input that x value of 1, 1 squared is 1 plus 1 leads us to that output of 2, right? That's going to be the algebraic approach we're going to take in a minute. We're looking for that point on the graph. But sometimes we can't just take our input of 3 and plug it in and figure out where that point on the graph is. So actually having the graph is helpful. Now if we didn't have the graph or the capability to graph, um, let's say we were, I don't know, limited to like a scientific calculator, then we can find the same information by looking at a table of values. So for instance, let's say I wanted to find the limit as x approaches negative 4 of 1 over x plus 4, so this rational function. Now I know what the graph looks like, but even if we didn't. So I want to know what's happening here, right, at an x value of negative 4, because that's the frame of reference, that's where we're told to look. But since I don't have the picture to actually see what we're getting closer and closer to, what I could do with the table of values is get closer and closer and closer to that value from the left and get closer and closer and closer to that value from the right. So think about a number line, right? Negative 3.9 is pretty close to negative 4, but negative 3.99 is closer, negative 3.999 is closer, negative 3.9999 is closer um, on the right side, and the same on the left. Negative 4.1 is close, but negative 4.01 is closer, and negative 4.001 is closer, and so on. So I can pick table values that get um, closer and closer and closer to the one that we are concerned with and analyze what's happening to our y values here. These, This is where the behavior um, is that we're going to be analyzing. Okay, So I can one by one plug these values in, but I prefer to use a calculator. Now you have your own graphing calculator, that's fine, but I like Desmos. So what I'm going to do is make a table in here by hitting the little plus sign and input a table. My x's I'll type in there, but in my y's I'm going to actually put my function in, which is 1 over x plus 4. So 1 over x plus 4. Now it's giving me the little triangle warning. Um, if you notice in the first column it doesn't just call the x values x values, it calls them x sub 1. So over here I'm going to put in x sub 1 so that it understands I want to take those x values and use them in that second column. Okay. So in my calculator I actually put in x sub 1 and x sub 1. All right, just to relate the two. So now I'm going to just type these values in, negative 4.1, and it will figure out or calculate the y value for me. So at negative 4.1, we have a y value of negative 10. At negative 4.01, it's negative 100. And then at negative 4.001, it's negative 1,000. And you probably know what's going to happen next. Negative 4.0001 one is going to be negative 10,000. And if I try to plug negative 4 in, it's going to say we're undefined because again negative 4 in the bottom of the fraction creates a 0, that's no good. So let me just get rid of that. Back to my calculator. Um, so at negative 4 we are undefined. Otherwise I could just use that value. Um, and then let's put in negative 3 point, oops, not 33, and I forgot my negative, sorry I have fat finger issues, 3, 4, 9, so that's going to be a positive 10,000, and then negative 3.999 is going to be a thousand, 
and then you probably already know what's going to happen here. That's going to be 100, and this is going to end up being 10. Okay, so we've got our table of values. Now again, let's try to understand what's happening. If I'm approaching from the left, so what is the limit of our function of 1 over x plus 4 as x is approaching negative 4 from the left? Okay, that's this side. Let me get rid of this. Okay, from the left, that's th this side over here. From the left, what's happening? Well, we got negative 10, then negative 100, then negative 1,000, uh, negative 10,000. And every time I insert a zero and get a little bit closer to negative 4, I'm going to add a zero to my number. Those outputs are going to get larger and larger and larger, and they're going to get, well, larger in the negative direction, so technically smaller, which means they're going to be approaching negative infinity. And the opposite thing is happening on the other side. So over here, if I wanted to find the limit of our function, 1 over x plus 4, as x is approaching negative 4 from the right. So from the right, right, this side over here, we're going this way, getting closer from the right. We started at 10, then 100, then 1,000, then 10,000, then we would have 100,000 if we inserted another 9 and got a little closer. And those numbers would keep growing and growing toward a positive infinity. Now because the one-sided limits are different, the limit as x approaches negative 4 for this function does not exist. And just so you can see graphically, Maybe you know what this graph looks like. I'm kind of hoping you do. But here it is uh, graphically. Okay, So there happens to be a vertical asymptote in this graph at negative 4. And so I can see as we are approaching from the left that that graph is going down forever. And from the right, it's going to go up forever. So it's um, approaching the vertical asymptote, but in different directions. So again, our limit does not exist. So obviously, you could do what I just did there, look at the actual picture of the graph and see that the limit doesn't exist, but using a table of values is a way to do this with a scientific calculator, not necessarily a graphing calculator. So we're going to say that here, this limit uh, does not exist. That would be our final answer on this one. Okay. Now I don't think I need a calculator for this next one because I can just actually find the inputs. All we got to do, I mean, find the outputs by just adding 2 to each of my inputs. So 1.9 plus 2 would be 3.9. And then 1.99 plus 2 would be 3.99. And this would be 3.999. And 2 plus 2 is going to be 4. And this would be 4.001, 4.01, and then 4.1. So again, we're approaching an x value of 2. And so here, if I wanted to find the limit of x plus 2 as x is approaching 2 from the left, right, from the left here, these getting closer and closer to 2, uh, I can see 3.9, 3.99, 3.999, we're getting closer and closer to 4. So from the left, the limit is 4. And also from the right, the same exact thing, right, the limit as x, or of x plus 2 as x is approaching 2 from the right. All right? If I come the other direction, this way, as these get closer and closer to 2, then these are getting closer and closer to 4 again. We're going to the same place. So the limit here is 4. Since those one-sided limits are the same, again, our limit here, this would be equal to a positive 4. And this would make Again, perfect sense if you look at the graph for this function, which is a linear function. Again, I'm hoping you know what this graph looks like, but just so we're all on the same page. If I graphed x plus 2, there's my graph. And as I get closer and closer to an x value of 2, and you can use your cursor on your graph too, and just as you get closer and closer to this x value, oops, I went too far, an x value of 2, you can see your graph is getting to that point at 4. So at 2, 4 we have a point on that graph. We're defined there. Nothing weird like a vertical asymptote happening. That's the limit uh, for this function as we approach 2. Okay. 
Now algebraically, we would try to do this without relying on any technology whatsoever by just inputting the x value that we're looking at. If we can just plug it in, right, like this one, x plus 2, if we plug in a 2, we get a 4, we find our limit, that would be the easiest way to do this, unless there's something weird happening in the graph like an asymptote. But again, if we just look at the graph, um, we can see that behavior. So let's try to do this algebraically. What y value would this function be approaching as x gets closer and closer to 2 is going to be the output when our input is 2. So algebraically, without making a table or having to go to a graph, we can just find the function value at 2, input a 2. So we would say that the limit here would be equal to this value of 2. It's going to just get plugged in here everywhere we have an x. So 2 squared minus 3 times 2 plus 5. So 2 squared is 4, negative 3 times 2 is negative 6, 4 minus 6 is negative 2, and negative 2 plus 5 is a positive 3. That's going to be our limit. And again, you can verify this with the picture. If you actually graphed this function, x squared minus 3x, let's see, minus 3x plus 5, then you can see, again, as x is approaching 2, there's a point on our graph here as x approaches 2. There it is. Our y value is 3. And that's going to be the same from both sides, whether I'm coming from the left or from the right. Okay? So the graph could be used. Again, a table of value could be used. But algebraically, let's just input what we would call c, the value of x that we are approaching. All right, now, this is where it gets a little uh, tricky. Again, I want to find this function value um, at 1 that would most likely represent the limit for this function, but I can't plug a 1 into this function because it would create a problem in the bottom of my fraction. But if we're trying to do this algebraically, there are some algebraic things we can do to try to manipulate our function so that maybe we could plug it in. And I'm hoping that you recognize x cubed minus 1. Um, that's a difference of cubes. That's something that we can factor. So I want to focus on the x cubed minus 1 over x minus 1, the function itself, for a second. So the top of our fraction is a difference of cubes. A difference of cubes factors, uh, since this is technically x cubed minus 1 cubed, it's going to factor into an x minus 1, and then an x squared plus x plus 1. It's just a formula for factoring cubes. I put some uh, review in the module 0 so you can look up review and factoring a difference of cubes if you need to. Um, the bottom of my fraction still has this factor of x minus 1. If I can factor the numerator like I just did and that one of the factors x minus 1 also occurs in the denominator then I can simplify this function. Right, This common factor can be reduced out and so our x cubed minus 1 over x minus 1 actually simplifies down to x squared plus x plus 1. That means here, this is the same as finding the limit of x squared plus x plus 1 as x approaches 1. So that function simplifies, and now we have something that a 1 can get plugged into. So now we can say that this is going to be equal to, again, our 1 can go in here. We're going to end up with 1 squared plus 1 plus 1, and that's just going to give us 3. So our limit's going to be 3. And again, graph this, and you're going to see the same exact thing occur. Now I'm going to go ahead and graph the original function, just to make sure I didn't you know, make a mistake anywhere. I put my original function in here. Then I should see on my graph, as we approach an x value of 1, just move my cursor here. You can see as we get closer and closer to 1 that we are from both sides getting to... Now it says undefined, which we said in the beginning also uh, would be true. We could not put a 1 in, but I can still see that that y value that we're getting closer and closer to is a positive 3 from both directions. Okay. So we've got options. I like the algebraic option, but you can always fall back on the graph or a table. Just 
like table of values is my last resort, but also helpful sometimes, okay? Uh, now what's happening in number eight is the same thing that happened in the last example. I cannot plug a negative three into this function, so I want to try to manipulate the function. So if I just focus on x squared plus x minus six over x plus three for a second, again, the top is factorable. Factors of negative six that make the positive one in the middle here are gonna be positive three and negative two. So that trinomial becomes an x plus three and on x minus two. And on the bottom I have that common factor of x plus three, which means again, that common factor can be reduced out. So this function simplifies down to just an x minus two. So finding the limit of this function is the same as finding the limit as x approaches negative three of this function, x minus two. And I can input a negative three into this function. So this becomes uh, negative three minus two, which means our limit's going to be a negative five. Again, just inputting negative three in. So we're gonna try to input our value. If we can't, try to manipulate the functions uh, so that we can, okay? Now here, again, I cannot input zero into this function, but I can't factor this one either. So I'm gonna take a different approach. Again, something that maybe you've seen in college algebra. In college algebra, actually, I think you rationalize denominators. Well, that concept can be applied to numerators. So I'm gonna rationalize the numerator here. So again, let me just focus on the function, the square root of x plus one minus one over x. What can I do to manipulate this function? Um, or I'm not changing its value, I can just try to rewrite it so that a zero could be plugged in. So what I can do here is rationalize the numerator. And I can rationalize a numerator or denominator, a binomial numerator or denominator, by multiplying by the conjugate of that numerator or denominator. So in this case, the conjugate of the numerator has the same terms, which would be a square root of x plus one and a one, but instead of a minus, the conjugate has a plus, the opposite sign. And if I multiply that on the top and the bottom, then technically I'm multiplying my fraction by one, which means I'm not really changing its value. I'm just making it look different, okay? I'm manipulating it so that eventually we'll be able to plug in a zero. So when I do the multiplication here, the square root of x plus one times the square root of x plus one, that's the square root of x plus one squared, that's gonna be an x plus one. And then the square root of x plus one times one is the square root of x plus one. And then here, I get the negative version of that, negative square root of x plus one. And then the negative one times one makes a negative one. That's my numerator. In my denominator, x times the square root of x plus one is just x times the square root of x plus one. And then x times one is gonna be an x. Now on the top of the fraction, lots of nice stuff happens here. First, these are gonna cancel, one's positive, one's negative, also plus one, minus one cancel. So all I have left in my numerator is an x, and in my denominator, both of my terms have an x as well, which means the three terms in this fraction, right, if they have that x in common, I can reduce that out. So I'm gonna reduce this fraction by dividing that common factor of x. So on the top, x divided by x is one, on the bottom, dividing out the x from each of those terms leaves me just the x plus one and then a one. So this is a new version of my function. I just manipulated by rationalizing the numerator. So finding the limit here is the same as finding the limit of what we have now is one over the square root of x plus one, what was it plus one? as x approaches zero. So finding these two limits is the same. It's the same function, it's just been manipulated. But now, I can actually plug the zero in. If I plug that zero in, then I end up with uh, one in my numerator, and then a square root of one plus one, oh sorry, not one, zero plus one, that's what we were trying to plug in, plus one. But this all works out, so one over, Zero plus one is one, and the square root of one is one. So one plus one here means one half is our limit, okay? Now I'm not gonna lie, that's a little bit more algebra than some of the other problems. And if you're, you know, a little rusty in some of your algebra, remember this is not the only way to find the limit. So we can also look at the graphical approach. A table of values would work fine. I just 
get a little lazy with the tables myself sometimes. So let me graph the original function, which is the square root of x plus 1, and then a minus 1, and on the numerator or denominator we had an x, right? So here is our function. And let me just zoom in here. We want to know what's happening to this function, what um, y value we're approaching as x gets closer and closer to 0. Well, you can see it. That's the place where we cross the, the axis here. As we get closer and closer, well, our function's undefined because, again, a 0 can't be input. But we can see that output that we're approaching from both sides is a half. It's 0.5. Okay, so the graphical approach is there if we need it. All right, so let's look at a couple more. Um, we've got piecewise functions. Now, I don't know if you've dealt with a piecewise function in a, in a minute, but same concept. So first, um, I want to, because in this piecewise function, we have different functions over different domains, I'm going to find the one-sided limits and make sure that they're the same. So in a piecewise function, um, I'll show this to you graphically in just a second. But uh, actually, maybe we'll do the graph first, because maybe you're looking at this going, I don't even know what the heck. Okay, So in a piecewise function, if you want to graph this in Desmos, which is Desmos is just wonderful, I'm going to type the first piece in, which is x plus 3 squared. Now if I want this, not this whole parabola, but this parabola for the x's that are just less than negative 3, as it says here, right, that restricted domain, then I'm going to, after I type my function in, go to my keyboard, put in a brace, and then put in my domain, which was x's less than negative 3. Okay, so that's what the first piece of this function looks like. And then I'm going to go into another line here, put the second piece of the function, negative 2x minus 6. But I only want this piece for, in braces here, the x values that are greater than or equal to negative 3. And there's what the second piece of this graph looks like. So I can see now that if I'm approaching negative 3, which is the limit I'm trying to find here, that on, from either side, I am approaching a y value of 0. So that should be my limit, both sides, OK? But how would we do this if we didn't have the graph? So let's look at the one-sided limits. If I approach negative 3 from the left, left of negative 3 would be the x's less than negative 3. Then I would plug into this function, right? This function corresponds with approaching from uh, negative 3 from the left. So if I plug negative 3 in here, then I'm looking at a negative 3 plus 3 is 0. 0 squared makes a 0. Now if I want to approach negative 3 from the right, right of negative 3 would be the x values greater than negative 3. So plug x into the second piece. So that's where I would get a negative 2 times negative 3 minus 6. So that's positive 6 minus 6, which again is 0. So from each side, I'm approaching that same y value of 0, which means our limit for f of x is 0. Now looking at this one, now we should be able to do this without having to go to our graph. So if I want to approach neg uh, positive 1 from the left, that would be less than 1. Let's plug in here. So from the left, 2 times 1 would be 2. 2 plus 4 is going to make 6. If I want to approach from the right, that would be the x is uh, greater than 1. Plug in here. Then I would have 1 half times 1, which is a half. 1 half minus 5 halves would be negative 4 halves, and negative 4 halves would be negative 2. So we're approaching two different places here. That tells me that this limit does not exist. And if you look at the graph, it will make perfect sense. So if I look at 2x plus 4, for the x's that are greater than or equal to 1, there's that piece. All right, I can see I'm approaching that value of 6 that we just put on the paper. If I put the other piece in here, 1 half x minus 5 halves. Again, this would be for the x's that are greater than 1. There's the second piece, approaching uh, negative 2, different places. Approaching different places, we have a disconnected graph here, which is why this limit is not existing. OK? All right, the last little piece is uh, finding more limits, but limits at infinity. When we're finding a limit as x approaches negative infinity or positive infinity, so as we approach positive or negative infinity, this is exactly like finding n behaviors, which we sort of reviewed in the beginning. So what's happening? What y value are we approaching as x goes to positive or negative infinity? Um, those n behaviors, those are our limits. Okay. 
If you know what the graph looks like, this is super easy. Like I know the basic picture here. This is a polynomial function with an odd degree, so I know that the left end should be going up and the right end should be going down. So I already know the limit uh, for both of these ends, um, which is good for me, right? But maybe not for you if you can't remember. If you don't know, that's fine. Use your calculator to look at the picture. So put in 5x cubed and minus 2x squared and then plus 1. So again, here's the what did I, oh, equals 1. I'm like, this looks wrong. Here's our picture, okay? So if I said as x goes to infinity and as x goes to negative infinity, what's happening? Let me sketch this out here. So here's our picture. Uh, was something like this, whatever. I'm really only concerned with the ends. As x goes to negative infinity, if we're on the x-axis going to negative infinity, we're going left. So go to the left end of the graph, and because this is going down, we're going down forever toward negative infinity, we would say the limit of f of x as x goes to negative infinity is that end behavior, which is negative infinity. Okay, now if I go to the right end, if we're on the x-axis going to infinity, that's the right end, well the right end is going up forever, and up forever would be toward positive infinity. So those end behaviors, right? Those are our limits. The same thing as finding the end behaviors. When we're finding limits at infinity or negative infinity, we're finding end behaviors, okay? So same thing here. If you know what the picture looks like, like if you know what your parent rational function or reciprocal function looks like, and then you're just shifting it up to, I already know this picture. If you don't, just put it in your calculator. So 1 over x plus 2. Here's the picture. So there's a vertical asymptote at 0. That should make sense. There's a horizontal asymptote at 2. Hopefully that makes a little bit of sense. So let's look here. Let me just sketch this out. So there's a horizontal asymptote at 2. I can see that. And I'll make this more clear. If you put y equals 2 there, there's, there's where your horizontal asymptote is. Okay. So um, one, two, horizontal asymptote there, vertical asymptote there, and then you have branches doing this basically. Again, if you know the picture already, this makes this even easier, but since we have that horizontal asymptote at two, I can see both ends of my graph are going to be approaching that horizontal asymptote. So if I said, um, as x goes to negative infinity, where is f of x going? Right? Uh, if we're on the x-axis going toward negative infinity or going to the left end of this graph, the graph is getting closer and closer to, that means the y values are getting closer and closer to that horizontal asymptote at 2. So that's the limit there. And the same thing on the other end. On the other end, as x goes to infinity, we're on the right end of the graph. Again, that right end is approaching that horizontal asymptote, which means those y values are still getting closer and closer to positive 2. That's the end behavior there. That is the limit there. Okay? So, I've given you lots of tools to find limits. I prefer the algebraic, but you have all the options. Whatever is going to work best for you. Um, you're not restricted in your calculator use, so by all means, do what you need to do. Um, and if you get to your homework and you get stuck, then reach out. Let me know if you need some help. Until next time, take care.